Hey there, Dave Pilatus, k and Missing Project, a copyrighted edition for our video page. We're in the office, in the library with Huck, and uh, Huck is doing really well. She's a very happy puppy, and she says she's overworked. She wants easier hours, and she says Daddy works too much, too, so, okay. You good? Thanks for being here. I'll let you out. Okay. Here you go. You can go see mommy. Good girl. Alrighty. So thanks for being here. This is a missing person segment. Make no doubt about it. And uh, what I'm going to do is we're going to go through a case that I've known about for years. And I've actually been reluctant to take it on. And people say, well, why would that be, Dave? Because I knew the specifics of the case. And I have some family friends that have gone through this. And it's beyond horrific. And let me start off by saying that when I was a police officer, <clears throat> We're given special training, in fact, a week's worth of training on how to deal with homes where there's been abuse or homes that don't seem as though that they can take care of a child. And there's a phrase there, ability to thrive. Does the child have the ability to thrive in that environment? Is there a support system? Is there food? Is there emotional and physical support? etc. And there were a number of times in my career where I went into a home apartment and one of the first things that you'd look is in the refrigerator. <clears throat> if there's no food, if there's nothing to eat, the child's coming with me. And we'd usually call a supervisor over and we'd also call Child Protective Services over. And the bottom line decision is the officer on the scene. And we were always taught to make your decision in the benefit area of the child, not the parent. Don't let emotions get in the way. Think more about that child's well being. Now, with that in mind, this case, when I first knew about it, actually brought a tear to my eye. And you say, well, why would that be, Dave? Well, because this, this child that we're going to talk about today didn't have a chance in life. And I mean that, didn't have a chance in life. Because... They were diagnosed with a condition that is absolutely horrific. And I know, I know about this a lot. The condition is called reactive detachment disorder. And from the Mayo Clinic, this is what it's, I'm sorry, from the Cleveland Clinic, this is what it says. RAD is a condition where a child doesn't form healthy emotional bonds with their caretakers, parental figures often because of emotional neglect or abuse at a very early age. Children with RAD have trouble managing their emotions. They struggle to form meaningful connections with other people. Children with RAD rarely seek or show signs of comfort and may seem fearful of or anxious around their caretakers, even in situations where their caretakers are quite loving and caring. What does reactive attachment disorder affect? and most common among children who experience physical and emotional neglect or abuse. While not as common in older children can also develop it, children may be more likely to develop RAD if they have many different parental figures like multiple foster care situations. This is exactly this case. We're taken away from their primary caretakers after bonding with them emotionally. Experience several traumatic losses in life have parental figures who didn't try to become emotionally close to them. 
I can't imagine a parent is that way, but I know they are. I know some are. Spent time in an institution like an orphanage where they didn't have a loving parent figure and they just laid in a crib. In some cases, parents who adopt children without knowledge of the child's history might have trouble forming a bond with the new addition to their family, especially if the child has any emotional instability. If you are a new parent and your child shows symptoms of RAD or you have difficulty connecting with them, talk with your child's health care provider for an evaluation. It's just a brief overview of what we're talking about. I have a very close friend who has a rad child. Situation was this person got a woman pregnant who he didn't know really well. And he had to leave the country because he was in the service. He was gone for a year and he came back and the woman never told him he had a child. They were from different parts of the U.S. After a year or so, he heard from friends after he was back that he had a child. So he immediately applied for parental rights. She denied him. They had DNA testing done. It was his child. He asked for dual custody. She refused. In the meantime, he found out that this woman was a really bad person. A really bad person. Uh, and all of the things I just read to you in there fit to this person and his daughter. And when he finally got custody, he really didn't know what to do. It was a child that was never loved, never cared for, couldn't attach to this person as her father, couldn't attach to anybody emotionally tried to destroy their, his family, who he had with children and a wife by that point. This is many years later when he finally won custody. Tried to do all the right things. He finally got some great counseling and the child was documented with RAD. And the, his child was, <clears throat> there's only a few things that really give RAD kids much hope. And that is just a, a parent who has 100% of the time to devote to that child and turn them around. And I mean 100%. Or the child has to go to one of these live-in facilities for a year to 14 months. My friend was crying. He was upset. It had ruined his family. This little girl had attacked other kids in the family. Had tried to destroy the family. He was it's hard to believe until you see it, but this was the second one in my career I knew about through a, a very close friend. So now I'm gonna tell you this story. And before I get into this story, I want you to go grab a coffee, Coke, some tea. Make sure you get an almond croissant. Put your feet up and you're gonna hear a story that's truly baffling sad. And it's a very famous story that you've probably heard of, and it's not that old. So go get your coffee, come right back, put me on pause. Okay, I see you have your hands full right now, that's good. The story involves a young girl named Serenity Denard. She went missing February 3rd, 2019 and went from Rockersville, North Dakota. She ran off from a facility called the Children, Children's Home Society of the Black Hills. Now, what's one of the reasons that children are at this facility? Reactive attachment disorder. And Serenity was there for a 14 month program. Per Serenity's dad, who was not related in the birth at all, was an adopted father, was that Serenity's original mom was in prison. And Serenity had been bounced to over a dozen foster care facilities in four 
years. I'm speechless. Seriously, I'm speechless. How could a child ever thrive under those conditions? And I don't blame one of those foster parents because they didn't have the means to deal with her. Our system is so broken. Well, foster parent number 13 was the Denards. And they tried their hardest to get serenity the emotional support, emotional bonds that she needed. And they thought they were making progress, so they, adopt, they adopted her. As in so many of these cases regarding these kids, she broke up the marriage of the Denards. Now the facility that she was staying at, this is actually the sign on the front of the building. The, Nar the Denards knew the counseling wasn't getting any better. She was constantly running away and her dad said she liked the chases and she was wickedly smart. And there's something else about these, these kids. They're so intelligent, all of them. And it's like they're playing a game with you. The Denards knew it was over and beyond what they could, could handle. So in July 2018, they worked with Medicaid and they got enough facility and she was at that facility for seven months. <clears throat> Let me explain this. These facilities, pretty much locked down. I mean, you could get away if you wanted to, but they're pretty much locked down. You have no access to email, no access to the internet, no access to a phone. All of the calls in and out of that facility to those kids are monitored and highly controlled and made at certain times of the process. It's not like, hey, I wanna call my dad, no. Very controlled. A counselor is always on the phone when the child is talking to a parent. Just so you understand it, this facility is, they know exactly what they're dealing with. Now on February 3rd, 2019 at 10.45 in the morning, Serenity Serenity is at the facility and she's with three other kids in the gym as part of their normal day. Well, one of the other four kids decides to run out a side door to escape. There's two counselors with four kids. One of the counselors chases the kid that's running away. Serenity looks around and says, well, one counselor's going one way. I'm going out the other door the other way. She runs out the door leaving one counselor with two kids. That counselor decided to stay with the two kids. Nobody was chasing Serenity. The counselor with the kids has a radio, immediately calls for assistance from other counselors. Now in February in North Dakota, it's really cold. And Serenity wasn't dressed for the cold. Long sleeve shirt, pants, snow boots, no coat. So this happened at about 10.30 in the morning. At about that time frame, a woman and her older grandchild were in the front of this facility visiting and saw Serenity run out the front 
onto the roadway and run north along the roadway. So this person backs up quickly, runs in, notifies staffs, jumps in the car, drives down to the roadway. All of that took less than three to five minutes. They said they got back to the roadway and she was gone. Well, the, the older grandchild that was in the car was asked, did any cars go by? No cars went by. Well, that meant that if no cars went by, then nobody should have been able to pick up Serenity. Now, when this happened within that first couple days, there's a lot of uproar in the community over what had happened because it's supposed to be a secure facility. And they stated that they called 911 immediately after Serenity went missing. Months later, the stories very the stories changed dramatically. Serenity walked out of that facility at about 10.30 in the morning. The first call coming into the Pennington County Sheriff on 911 is at 10, or it's at 12.26. It's almost two hours later. 12.45, the first Pennington County Sheriff arrives at the facility. 30 minutes later, four deputies are in the area searching for Serenity. So that's at 116. Now we're talking almost three hours. 128, Pennington County Sheriff's requests a search and rescue call out, and they start assigning investigators to the case. February 3rd, a very cold day in North Dakota. There was very little snow on the ground and there wasn't enough snow on the ground to aid trackers to show tracks. February 4th, a plane couldn't fly because of light snow and temperatures at night were in the minus category. Meantime, they had about 70 searchers per day and canines every day of this search. February 4th and 5th. Remember this happened on February 3rd, February 4th and 5th. 200 searchers, six dog teams, and one plane. All of the neighbors in that area were stopped, interviewed, contacted, yard searched. The Denards were contacted by the sheriff. Just north of this facility is the Rapid City, and Rapid City Police assisted the Pennington County Sheriff. Extremely cold temperatures that were explained to be hazardous to searchers and hazardous to canines. Remember, Serenity did not have warm clothes. Serenity was not seen by anybody on the roadway other than the grandparent and granddaughter when they were at the facility and they saw her running off. February 6th, incident happened February 3rd, February 6th. Pennington County Sheriff sold a press conference. They stated that they're still searching for Serenity, but they didn't believe that she could survive these cold temperatures at night. So the new classification for Serenity is missing, presumed deceased. I've been asked a lot of questions about that. I do think that that's probably the correct classification just because it was so dang cold. Now, this was the flyer put up by the Pennington County Sheriff's on Serenity. February, so the sheriff said presumed deceased. Now, the sheriffs didn't believe that she had any one to meet her for a ride outside because there was no way for her while she's inside to talk with anybody. She had no access to outside communications. February 7th, the sheriff stated, inclement weather stalled the search and rescue. There was snow and sub-freezing temperatures. February 8th, the home was confronted about the timeline of the events and initially stated serenity ran before noon. Correct time was 1045. 
and called 911 right away. They actually called at 1226. So the home took a lot of heat over the wording and the phrases and the times that they insinuated that they had. February 9th through the 14th, 14 canines from throughout, throughout the Western US were summoned to North Dakota to help on this search. They were gonna have a weekend search of February 9th and 10th. <clears throat> the specialties included tracking, tracking air scent, urban and wilderness searches. There were specifically seven dogs from four states, South Dakota, Colorado, Wyoming, Iowa. And these dogs were split between live and cadaver scents. A company called Rushmore Helicopters volunteered two days of flight time and carried two Pennington County sheriffs and spotters looking for a body, looking for anything, clothing, stripped, whatever. That weekend of February 9th and 10th produced nothing. February 11th, search and rescue was placed on hold because of freezing temperatures. February 12th and 13th had warmer temperatures. There were 20 Pennington County deputies and search and rescue and Rapid City Police and Rockerville Fire also assisted. They found nothing. All of those dogs, all of that time, nothing. February 22nd, this is 2019. Hold a press conference. Pennington County Sheriff's outlined what they'd been doing. They had issued three search warrants for records. They didn't say what those were. My guess is it was records from inside that facility that they didn't want to give up for medical purposes. But the deputies needed to understand why she was there, the lockdown facility nature, her background, etc. I'm guessing though, I don't know. They also did 188 interviews and they used the FBI for issues outside of the state of North Dakota. They stated as the weather warms, more searches would be completed. Step forward, about a month, March 26th, searches began again. There was freezing rain, snow, and a blizzard halted that search that day. There was a weather opening on March 27th and they brought in canines, helicopters, ground pounders. They searched all day, found nothing. They came back the next day with search and rescue dogs from four states again, 200 searchers on the ground, following a precise grid pattern that was laid down by the deputies, nothing. May 1st, a cadaver dog got a mild hit on a death scent, a cadaver scent. These dogs will only hit on the death of a human scent, not animal death. They said it was a mild hit, but that area was subsequently searched intensely, and I'm talking intensely, for three days. No other dog indicated, and the scent didn't come up again. But they weren't giving up with that. No, no, no. June 6th and 7th, 120 searchers were organized by the Sheriff's Office, Rapid City Police, U.S. Air Force, South Dakota Civil Air Patrol, Wyoming Search and Rescue, on a methodical GPS search as a carryover from the May event. Now, this is a map of where the children's home is located. This is Rapid City up here. This is the home facility. This is very, very rural in here. She left the facility. There's a very faint road right here. And she walked north. It's the last area she was going to, going north. Now, this is a map of a search and rescue they did. So she was last seen in front of the home right here. The black line indicates the home, the road the home was on, and the going north. Blue means it's intensely searched. She's going north, and they fanned out, and this is just combed umpteen dozen times. Blue, 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 blue. 
Now, the methodology they used, I don't understand it, but that's not because they did it wrong. Trust me. This is not because they did this wrong. And I'll explain this more. But I just want to give you a heads up about how this GPS works. February 2020. 1,200 people had searched for serenity. 220, I'm sorry, this is June 2020, June. 1,200 people had searched. 220 leads were tracked down and followed to conclusions by the sheriff's office. 4,500 miles were hiked. 465 interviews were done. 65 different agencies participated in the search and investigations. The real mystery, according to the sheriff at the time, where's Serenity? Sheriff stated that there was no evidence of, of an abduction. The lead detective on the case now was a man named Jim, Jamin Hartland. Jamin knew that Serenity had a history of running away and liked to see people chasing her. He also stated that the parents were not suspects, not in the least. Both were accounted for. After, so in April 12th of 2023, the sheriff stated that this is the biggest mystery in North Dakota history. And the Denards, her adoptive parents, had been harassed incessantly immediately after the disappearance. Let me tell you something. I find that appalling and disgusting. Serenity's only chance in life were the Denards. They put her in that home because it gave her a chance at life. I know these kids and staying with parents in that environment wasn't going to work. She continued to run away. She had a long history of running away all the time. And she was doing harm to herself in the meantime. The Denards did the exact appropriate thing. Exact. Anybody who thinks differently doesn't have a clue what these kids are about. Well, as you can guess, the real question is, what really happened here at that home? Well, the South Dakota Department of Special Services and the Federal Center for Medicaid did a joint investigation. Their conclusion was is that there were several errors made and that the home played a role in Serenity's disappearance. Subsequently, two employees were fired and there were new policy mandates calling for counselors to immediately call 911 when a child escapes. Now let me talk about the Sheriff's Office, Pennington County Sheriff's. I've read probably 9,000 search and rescue reports, cases, etc. I seriously doubt there's anyone better read on that issue in the world, honestly. And without a doubt, the Pennington County Sheriff's did an absolutely amazing job on this search. There were a countless number of days that they got their search and rescue people into the field, rallied and got other dogs from out of state that had the expertise to do it, and never gave up. They were facing insurmountable odds in horrific weather conditions, and these volunteers went out and did it again and again and again, trying to find her. They knew those first couple days meant everything, 
And those first days after she disappeared, they were out there in mass. The number of times they brought canines to that scene is more than I've ever heard anywhere in the world the canines have been brought back to. And it wasn't just one dog, two dogs. One day had 14 different dogs spread out over the countryside. That's organization and that's effort. The working between Rapid City Police and the Pennington County Sheriff's on paper looked outstanding. I don't know about the behind the scene politics, but everything I read, outstanding. Serenity is still an open case. She's never been found. And as the deputies say, it's a huge mystery. What do I think? The deputies working the case believe that she's out there, somewhere out there, deceased. then why can't the cadaver dogs pick up the scent? They had the best cadaver dogs in the Western US out there. And a cadaver dog can pick up a scent for miles away. Now search and rescue manuals say that a girl nine years old will get found 95% of the time in seven miles or less. Personally, I would put dogs out to 10 miles, uh, cadaver dogs, and start walking in with the dogs. It's possible that she's out there. But the deputy's right. And I'm not privy to all of the areas that were searched or the distances that they went out to search. But knowing the history behind the cases that I've worked and I've presented to you, the distance some of these children are found in is phenomenal. Two and three times what search and rescue manuals say. So according to the seven miles, it could be 14, it could be 20. I don't know. But it was a rural setting. One road back into humanity, per se. That's north. Rapid City was really the first big city north from the road that she would walk in on. There's a smaller city called Rockerville, but not very big. I'll show you the map again. So her facility was on this little, little road right here, South Rockerville Road. And that goes into Rockerville. Not a very big town. Or you can also stay on this secondary road and pick up Highway 16 that'll take you into Rapid City. This area, I can tell you, was searched intensely many times for many, many, many days. Our most susceptible children need to be guaranteed safety in any live-in facility that they're ordered to go to. And if that safety can't be guaranteed, then that facility ought to be closed. I, I understand the complexity of someone like Serenity, because I've seen it. It's more complex than I could ever explain to you. These children are so, so different. They don't respond to you normally. They don't act normal. They can be ultra aggressive. One of Serenity's diagnosis is that she had wild mood swings as well. Next steps. I honestly have a feeling that Pennington County Sheriff's and their search and rescue teams are probably still searching this area when they have training, etc. That's what I'd do if I was a search and rescue organizer. But 
I feel ultra bad for the Denards. At this point, it's probably safe to say that Serenity is deceased. But the Denards have been horrific victims themselves. The attacks they took online needlessly, stupidly. I feel so bad for them. I hope they're doing better. I know that they had to go through a divorce. And the wife even admitted that she had tried to take her own life on two occasions because she, she felt so, so hated. My gosh, what kind, of, what kind of world is this? Now, there is the off chance Serenity might be alive somewhere. Here's the two pictures of the girls. She, she looks a little different in, in both pictures. Now, she'd be 13 years old now. Quite a bit more mature. She would probably still respond to the name Serenity. She was probably, if she's still alive, something horrific has happened. And I'm sure that she's even in worse shape now than we could ever imagine. But I suppose we've got to pray for that. Thanks for being here, folks. It was a hard case for me. It's a hard one to think that we have. We have other kids like this living in our world right now. They deserve better. And for the parents that treat their kids in this horrific manner, I have no words for you. I have no words. Light us out.